are you serious about change? And I'm, I'm very sure as I speak. He's letting us know the power that is behind the gospel is the righteousness of God. If you do your part, the promise will be fulfilled to you. Not only is it self-control to make yourself not do something, but it's also self-control to tell yourself to do something. Hello, everybody. We're back for another installment of the wonderful Fig Leaf Doctrine series. We're back for the third installment of Occupy Till I Come. And I hope that you've been learning a lot from part one and part two, and not only learning a lot, but I pray that you have been applying the principles that you picked up from the two former studies. Now let's uh, invite the presence of the Lord to be with us before we go any further. So let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, it's always a blessing to stand before your people, Father. Lord, we pray that this series has been a blessing for many, Lord, and we ask that your grace and your name be magnified, Father, and that it may manifest your love towards us, Father, and bringing us out of uh, misunderstandings and allowing us to see the beauty of your word. So, Lord, now we pray for the revelation of Jesus Christ. We ask that you baptize us with your Holy Spirit, and that you do always teach us what righteousness by faith and the power of the gospel is. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, getting back to the story that we continued in part two. One of the lessons that we learned, there were two servants. One of the servants, the Bible said, was blessed. And the servant that was blessed was the one when his Lord came, he was found watching. And then we saw there was another servant. And the Bible says when he saw that the Lord delayed this coming or that the Lord tarried, he began to eat and drink with the drunkard. And also he began to smite his fellow servants. So we're going to go through the Bible and see what does it mean to watch? Because we learn from Luke that the servant who was watching when his Lord came was blessed and we want to receive that blessing. So let us go through the word of God and see what does it mean to watch. Well, one of the best places to start, I believe, is in Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2 is one of my, one of my favorite, favorite uh, verses in the Bible. And I, I pray after this, it be one of your favorites, by God's grace. But nevertheless, whatever verse is your favorite is, is good. So let's go to Habakkuk chapter 2. And let's start at verses 1. And we're trying to figure out what does it mean to watch? Because we want to we wanna receive the blessing when our Lord comes. And we want to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So we want to recognize and we want to discover from the word of God what was that blessed servant doing when the Bible says he was watching. So now let's look at verse 1 in Habakkuk. And the Bible reads, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see what he shall say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. So now we see Habakkuk is telling us something. First of all, when you look at, and it said that word stand, well in the Hebrew, that means I'm going to be steadfast, I'm going to be firm, I'm going to plant my feet in the sand, I'm going to make a mark of demarcation, I'm going to say this is what I'm doing and I'm putting all my effort into it and I shall not be moved. That's what that word stand means. And then he couples with, I'm going to stand upon my watch. Now that word watch means my responsibility. The responsibility, of course, in this context that God has given him, of course, was the, the office of a prophet. So he's saying, I'm going to be firm and I'm going to stand upon my responsibility and I shall not be moved from it. And then he says this, and set me upon the tower and I will watch to see 
what he will say unto me. So now the Bible is saying that Habakkuk the prophet, he says that I'm going to be firm. I'm going to stand upon my watch and I'm going to watch and see what he says unto me. Now this word watch in the Hebrew is a different word from the first word watch. This doesn't necessarily mean my responsibility. This word watch in the Hebrew means that I am going to go up to the tower, a high tower, so that I can lean forward and pierce into the distance. So just like in medieval times or even now, they have towers. You go to a prison, they have a high tower with the guard stands in a high tower because from a high tower, you can see the view better. You can see further into the distance. So he's telling us and he's using this analogy saying that I am going up to this tower that I can lean forward and pierce into the distance. Now, in this context, this means prophecy. He's going to look into the future. How? By God's grace. So then he says that one of the reasons why I'm doing it. So that I can see. What the Lord is going to say. I'm looking into the future. I'm reading prophecy so I can see what the Lord is going to say to me. And then number two is that I need to know how to answer those when I am rebuked. Now that word in the Hebrew for rebuked is argue with. So now we see there's two reasons why he was leaning forward or studying prophecy. One, he needed to see or hear what the Lord was going to say unto him. And number two, he needed to know what to say to those who are arguing with what this brother had to say. Now watch how the Lord responds. Verse two. And the Bible says, and the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. And make it plain upon tables, not one, but tables, that he may run that readeth it. So now the Bible is telling us something that God's response was to hear what he was going to say and to see what I shall answer when I'm arguing with. God's response was, write the vision, brother. And make it plain upon tables that he that readeth it may run. And in the Hebrew, that, that word for run means may understand it quickly. That he may understand it quickly. Now, the, 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 the blessing about that is that that reminds me of 2 Timothy 2.15. That says, we rightly divide the word of God. We divide it quickly. That's the same meaning, per se. That we may understand it quickly. Now, let's learn something about the vision. Let's learn something about the vision. It tells us in verse three that for the vision is yet for an appointed time. So we see that this vision involves an appointed time. So in other words, time prophecy, there is a certain amount of time for the fulfillment of this vision or these visions that are connected to the tables. So then it says this. But at the end. It shall speak. And not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it shall surely come and will not tarry. So in other words, God is counseling us and he's letting us know the vision is coming, but it's going to tarry. But then he counsels us and says, even though it tarries or even though it lags or even though it, 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 it occupies, he said, wait, just wait for it because it's coming. So in other words, he said it's going to tarry, but it ain't going to tarry as long as you think it's going to tarry. So I, I need you to wait for it because it's coming. It's coming. Now, why is that important for Seventh-day Adventists? Let me read a statement from Great Controversy. Great Controversy, uh, page 392, paragraph 2, and it reads, as early as 1842, the direction given in this prophecy to write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it has suggested to Charles Fitch the preparation of a prophetic chart to illustrate the visions of Daniel and Revelation. The publication of this chart was regarded as the fulfillment of the command given by Habakkuk. No one, however, then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, there was a tarrying time, is presented in the same prophecy. 
After the disappointment, this scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and shall not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry, but the just shall live by his faith. So now we see that according to the history of our church, we recognize that we have some church in fulfillment to the prophecy of Habakkuk. What you see on my right side, this is the 1843 chart. And what you see on my left side is the 1850 chart. And this chart came in after the great disappointment in 1844. But this, according to the prophets, is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Habakkuk 2. So the Bible is telling us that when we're leaning forward and we're studying prophecy, this is how we stand upon our watch. And what, why are we studying prophecy? So we can hear what the Lord has to say to us and that we can know what to answer when we argue with. And he said, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables that he that readeth may run. So now we see that this is very significant in our history. So how did Jesus watch? Because Jesus is our example for everything. So let us ask ourselves, how did Jesus watch? Let's go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. This is the first gospel in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 26. And we're going to read verse 1 and verses 2. And it says this. And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days in the feast of the Passover, the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. So now Jesus is preaching prophecy to his disciples. And he's saying, after two days, I'm going to be crucified. Not only is he preaching prophecy, but he's telling them what to look for. He's taking them back into the prophecies of the Old Testament. How do I know that? How do I know that? Well, let's continue on. We're going to find out. So we see that Jesus preached prophecy to his disciples. So now let's go to verse 24 and 25. Same chapter. Because it's talking about some of the same things. It says this, verse 20, uh, 24 and 25. Matter of fact, let's go back to 23. And he answered and said, he that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It has been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it all? He said unto him, Thou hast said. So now we see again Jesus is preaching prophecy to his disciples. And not only that, he's preaching the fulfillment of prophecy. How do we know that? Well, let's go. Let's go back. Let's check it out. Let's go to Zechariah. This is in the Old Testament. Let's go to Zechariah chapter 11. And now I just want to caution you. Don't get mixed up with Zephaniah. We're looking for Zechariah. Chapter 11, and we're going to start at verses 12 and 13. Zephaniah, I mean, Zechariah 11, 12 and 13, and it reads, And I said unto them, If ye think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter, a goodly price, that I was praised as of them, and I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Then I cut asunder my own staff, even bands, that I may break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. So now we see Christ is prophesying that Judas was going to betray him for 30 pieces of silver. And he's telling his disciples that this is going to happen. But this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus was preaching prophecy. 
Jesus was preaching prophecy. And remember from the last uh, message that the prophets are the eyes of the body. The prophecy is like a light unto a dark place. Those who are in 1 Thessalonians 5 who were students of prophecy were called the children of light. And they were counseled to watch and to be sober. So Jesus is teaching prophecy that his students can watch and that we can be sober. So now let's go to Matthew 26, verse 31. And hold your friend and uh, your hand in Zechariah because we're coming back. Matthew 26, the same chapter we were in, and verse 31. And hold your finger in Zechariah. 26, 31 says this. Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me that night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after that I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. So again, Jesus is preaching prophecy. How do we know that? Let's go to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. Zechariah 13, verse 7. And the Bible reads, Awake, O sword, against my shepherds. And against the man that is my fellow, says the Lord of hosts, smite the shepherd and his sheep shall be scattered. And I will turn my hand upon the little one. So we see that Jesus was a student of prophecy, number one. And Jesus also taught his disciples prophecy. So now let's continue on this train to see how do we watch for Jesus? Because then he gives us an example. Let's start at verse 36. Verse 36. And it reads thus. This is Matthew 26. And we're starting at verses 36. And this is what it reads. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And says unto his disciples, sit ye here while I go pray a yonder. Verse 37. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then says he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here and watch with me. So Jesus is telling his disciples how to watch. So Jesus is saying, my, my, my soul is, is sorrowful. And he's in the garden of Gethsemane. And he tells his best friend, his best disciples, Peter, James, and John, to tarry here with me and watch. And then the Bible says in verse 39, And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thy will be done. Verse 40. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me for one hour? So now we see that Peter fell asleep and he was not watching. Now this is the same situation that was going on in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. This is the same situation that was going on in Luke when the servant said, my Lord delayeth his coming. And he began to eat and drink with the drunkards. He was drunken who were drunken with the wine of Babylon. And he began to smite his fellow servants. And then the Bible says that his Lord was going to come in the day when he stopped watching. So what happens when you stop watching? You fall asleep. Or you could say when you are asleep, you can't watch. As I asked last time, is it possible to watch if your eyes are closed? There is no way you can watch if you are asleep. You only can watch if your eyes are open. And what does Isaiah 29 tells us? That the prophet is our eyes. You can only have your eyes open. You can only be watching through prophecy. So now let's see. Let's continue on. So Peter falls asleep and implies all the disciples have fell asleep, all three of them. And he says this, verse 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. 
The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we see there's a reason that we are supposed to watch through prophecy, but we also supposed to pray. And that is signifying the righteousness by faith message. So we are supposed to watch and pray. Why? So we do not enter into the hour of temptation. That's why we study prophecy. That's why we pray. That's why we grab a hold of the righteousness of Christ, that when the hour of temptation comes, we can be ready to meet it. But these brothers did not prepare for the hour of temptation. When they were supposed to be watching and praying, they were asleep. So now the Bible tell, tells us this in verse 42. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, that will be done. Now, if you look at what Christ is talking about, remember what he breaks down in verse 1 and 2 of Matthew 26. He knows that he is about to die. He knows that. So now he knows the hour is coming for him to die. How does he know that? From Daniel chapter 9. The 70 weeks prophecy. He knew based on prophecy that his time was coming to die. So based off the prophecy, he was praying to the father based off the prophecy, the understanding of the hour that was about to come. So he was praying based off his understanding of prophecy. So then verse 43 says this, and he came and found them asleep again for their eyes were very heavy. Now remember we saw that those who are asleep are the ones who are drunken. Those who are drunken are the ones who are in the night, who are the ones who send peace and safety. These are the ones who are not watching because their eyes are closed. What are the eyes? The eyes are the prophets. They have rejected the prophets and the prophecy. Therefore, their eyes are closed because the prophets is the eye. And these brothers had their eyes closed. Again, is it possible to watch if your eyes are closed? If you don't know prophecy, how can you watch for Jesus? So now it says this. Verse 44. And he lifted them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and said unto them, sleep on, sleep on now. And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Raise, let us be gone. Behold, he is at hand that doeth betray me. So now we just recognize something. Jesus knew that the hour of his betrayal was coming, and he told them in verse 1 and 2. So they were supposed to be watching and praying and preparing for that hour based on prophecy. But instead of watching and praying, their eyes were closed and these brothers were asleep. So Jesus, once it gets to a certain point, he said, you might as well stay asleep, bro, because the time is now. And what were they supposed to be watching for? Verse 47. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with him a great multitude with swords and staffs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign saying, whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. So now we see what the disciples were supposed to be praying and watching for was the rising of the son of perdition. How do we know that? Let's go to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. John 17, and let's go to verse 12. And the Bible reads, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that, gave, that you gave me, I kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So now we see again, that was another fulfillment of prophecy. But even on the other hand, that what Jesus was praying for and what he was telling his disciples to watch for was the rising of the son of perdition. Because he knew that the son of perdition was coming. And he told his disciples, based on prophecy, you need to be watching for the rising of the son of perdition, which is called the hour of temptation. 
But instead of watching, these brothers were asleep. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with Bible prophecy, but there is another power that's called the son of perdition. And we're going to get to that power very shortly. Not in this message, but we're going to get to it. So now let, let's look at one more thing. Because now we see, by Jesus' example, how we are supposed to watch. So now let's look at one more thing. Now we see by Jesus' example how we are supposed to watch. How do we watch? We watch through prophecy. Both the preaching of prophecy and also by things that have already been fulfilled. That's how you watch for Jesus is by prophecy. And if we can't understand prophecy, we can't watch for Jesus. So now let's look at Revelation 17 as we come to a close. Let's look at Revelation 17. Revelation 17, that's the last book of the Bible. And they always say, save the best for last. So now let's look at verse 2, verse 5, and verse 8. And it reads, with whom the kings of this world have committed fornication and the habitation of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the name of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colors and decked with purple and precious uh, stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of the abomination and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her name, her forehead was the name of written, mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered at great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore doest thou marvel? I tell thee a mystery of the woman and of the beast that she writheth upon, and has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest and was, and, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and goeth into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names are not written in the book of the Lamb of Life from the foundation of the world. When they beheld the beast that was is not and yet it is. So now we see that this same beast power goes down into perdition. Now we're going to deal with this extensively in part four. But we see how you watch for Jesus is through prophecy. And we see what the disciples were supposed to watch for, which is a lesson to us, is the coming of the son of perdition. And this is what we're supposed to be watching for. And how do we watch? We watch through prophecy. In connection with what? The 1843 chart and the 1850 chart. This is how we watch. And remember we learned in Isaiah 29, if you are drunk and if you are asleep, the vision is sealed up to you. Remember Habakkuk said, write the vision and make it plain upon these two tables. If you are drunken or asleep, you can't understand these charts. How do you get drunken? We learn by the wine of Babylon. And 1 Thessalonians 5 admonishes us to watch and to be sober. Matthew 26 says, watch and pray. That's be students of prophecy. That's how we watch. And how we be sober and pray is by the righteousness by faith message. So I want to encourage you to become students of prophecy that you may watch for your Lord and your Savior, Jesus Christ, and his beautiful appearing. Because Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. So I pray that this has been a blessing to you. Until we go into Occupy to our come part four, I hope to see you again. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to watch and to be sober. We thank you for laying down in your word through the example of Jesus Christ, how we watch for you. We watch 
by prophecy, by being students of prophecy in the fulfillment and also watching for the future events. You let us know many a times through your word that Jesus was a student of prophecy. And he is the point of prophecy. So, Lord, we thank you for loving us. And we pray that you forgive us of our drunkenness and forgive us of our sleep. For indeed, the spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. So remove this flesh from us and give us the spirit of your son. Give us a new nature, Lord, that we can receive your blessing. Thank you for loving us, Father. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. So until next time, everybody. I just want to encourage you and remind you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That is some beautiful words. That's not just words. That's power right there. God loves you and he loves you enough to do something about it. And remember, he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.